Oh, there you are, Eric. Didn't see you popping up. Just jumping in now. What's going on? Too much. Too much. Real quick note. Last two weeks, I had some pretty good content. I've been going through and I'm trying to cut out the case that you and Teresa did two weeks ago into its own separate module on the case with a trigeminal facilitation manifesting. I think it was an M2 distribution in the face. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll try and get that up this week. And I'll take together kind of what we've been doing with the PowerPoint because I was at the back end of that two weeks ago, trying to yeah. combine it with what we did last week and, and put together these, this PowerPoint presentation so that we have it as like one continuous one cool. in one video. So I'm just yeah. trying to kind of cut into those up. It's just a little more time consuming than I'd hope to be. Yeah, that I can imagine. We can open it up if there's any questions as we've done the format. Hopefully it's flowed well the past couple of days for you with some questions and some didactic that we need. I think it's been pretty good so far as far as the information we covered, just viewing the videos. But we can go from there. Yeah, anybody's got questions, now's the time. Dave, um, are there any videos to reference for mid cervical manipulations i'm on the like impact page and i see a hyperlink to locking i think mostly related just to cv um but i'm looking for like you know man manipulation videos from for extension or flexion from below or below above or u joints or anything like that could you ask like some of the techniques we've gone into are typically were typically covered in what was at that point a module nine and we've and with the online didactic what we've been able to do is take a lot of the techniques that were typically done in a module nine and blend them into their earlier courses so some of the above and below techniques may not be in the module two six and seven 
like looking at above and below. So I'll do this. I'll take a look at the module nine video techniques where I know that they exist in there with some blocking and barriering. And I'll see if I can, I can get them up. Because there's some advanced techniques, which Eric, I think Eric Pop has probably shown you in module seven. You know, I, um, I actually do see it one listed under M2. So I'll, I'll start with that actually. Thank you. It still works. Go ahead and say something, Eric. I want to see if my speaker's working. Yeah, I got you right here. Okay, good. My, mine's really quiet today for some reason. But... Cool. So mm -hmm. that happens to me sometimes where my the speakers like won't engage or something like that. It'll come on and be trying to listen to something and then it doesn't no yeah. sound at all. So I guess it's better if it's just quiet. Um, all right. Uh, do we have anything else? Any other questions? Anything you guys want to talk about before we get into the back into the energetics, of the lower extremity? No. All right. We'll get started then. Am I good to share here, Dave? Looks like. Should be, should be automatic. Okay. You're seeing it? Yes. Okay. Um, I wanted to backtrack just a couple of slides here, um, just so that we, we have kind of a good grasp of what's going on here with the foot in general. Um, so basically what we were talking about toward the end of last session is we were talking about how the mechanics of the foot create this kind of um, what we would consider a, a flattened or dis dis distended type of um, uh, position of the foot. And all this does for us is it lengthens all this connective tissue, puts in all this tension through the um, uh, plantar fascia, through the long and short plantar ligaments, posterior interosseous ligament, and all these different things in order to kind of produce this passive uh, kinetic energy. And then once the heel lifts, this energy is kind of released back into the limb um, in order to help propel us forward um, with more of what we consider that passive energy generation as opposed to something where we have to add in a lot of extra muscular effort. Okay, so I wanted to take a quick look through this stuff again um, real quick just so that we have it all together. Um, but basically here, we're looking at this from heel strike, okay? So going um, at the beginning of heel strike, it should be a very efficient phase of gait, okay? Heel strike and that heel rocker should be one of the most efficient phases of gait as we make contact with the ground and start to rocker forward over that limb towards stance phase, okay? So what should happen first is the fourth and fifth metatarsal heads should come down and make contact with the ground. And as that happens, the subtalar joint will start to evert, okay? As our body weight starts to transition over that, we're going to get that calcaneus starting to evert, okay? As that happens, we're actually going to put tension onto the posterior interosseous ligament. We talked about this way back in module four, that that particular ligament has no nerve endings to it or no nociceptive nerve endings to it anyway. So it's not capable of producing pain. So what it's there for essentially is to help produce additional movement because we're supposed to tension this ligament. It's supposed to be a very powerful ligament, um, something that's allowed to basically help tilt the talus in the same direction as the calcaneus. Now, what happens with this is the talus is, is now at this point, as we're moving into a mid stance phase, more toward a neutral dorsiflexion position, um, the talus becomes wedged up into the ankle mortis, right? As that, the mortis, uh, excuse me, the top of the tail, dome of the talus is shaped like a wedge, kind of like this, the uh, tip of the wedge being the posterior element. So as this kind of moves into that mortis, it um, essentially tightens the uh, inferior uh, tibiofibular ligament. Okay, this is a very elastic ligament again, um, and it essentially close packs the tib-fib mechanism. And it's going to drive 
the fibula superiorly up underneath the um, the plateau of the tibia, right? So just underneath that the edge of the tibia, the fibula will come up and, and compress into its um, articular space. This will create a nice stable base for the peroneal muscles to contract, okay, which is essential. Um, the peroneals, especially, in, we're really talking about uh, peroneus longus here, because peroneus longus, if we take a thought for a second about its anatomy, will come off the superior portion of the fibula, drop down, and it'll actually loop underneath the cuboid, right? So the cuboid is kind of this, um, it's kind of wedge-shaped, almost like that, um, where the medial pole here is, is a little more prominent. And so this uh, tendon will actually come down and loop underneath the cuboid here. So if we have a poorly uh, closed-packed cuboid, contraction of the of the uh, peroneal uh, peroneus longus will actually pull on this portion of the of the cuboid, and what it does is it takes that uh, that medial pull and it pulls it down toward the ground. So a lot of times when we have a plantarly subluxed cuboid, it's actually due to the contraction of the peroneus longus. Um, where we don't have adequate close packing of the cuboid between the fourth and fifth metatarsal bases and the anterior portion of the calcaneus, right? So as the calcaneus starts to evert, what happened, and we start to, our weight starts to go over the top of the cuboid, we should have this anterior to posterior compressive force that creates a nice stable close pack position of the cuboid in between those two. Um, the problem is, is when the peroneus contracts real strongly with this, it's usually because something's been put under the medial side of the foot and it's tilted us um, toward the outside of the foot, like in an inversion ankle sprain position, for instance. The peroneal will contract. We're not closed packed through that cuboid and we can get this plantar subluxation. Um, so that's that's a potential uh, pathoanatomical or pathomechanical type of situation that can occur with the cuboid. Um but it's its purpose, the purpose of doing this, because as this tendon loops underneath the cuboid, it actually transitions all the way to the medial side of the foot and attaches to the base of the first metatarsal and the distal portion of the medial cuneiform. Okay, we, we did um, a good amount of landmarking, anatomical landmarking in module four for the foot. Um, so you guys should be pretty good at this point at finding that tubercle uh, for the peroneus longus. But basically its job as this, as this contraction occurs is to take that first metatarsal and pull it down toward the floor, right? So as that pulls down toward the floor, what it should do is it should create a nice rigid lever, okay? And then also set those sesamoid bones onto the ground, right? They come down and boom, they hit the ground just like that bridge we were talking about during last session, creating a nice, relatively frictionless surface for the first metatarsal head to pivot over as we go into push off. Okay, we have any questions about that? No? All right, we'll keep moving. All right, so we talked about this again last session, but just to kind of hammer this home, because I did feel like we were maybe a touch rushed with it. The setting of the sesamoids is really, it, it's very important. It's actually, it, it's essential for load transfer um, to the medial foot from the lateral foot. If we look at the bottom of somebody's foot, right? If we just lay them down and we look at the bare skin on the bottom of the foot, we tend to see this um, kind of curvilinear shape of, of, it's basically skin wear is what it ends up being. Um, from the lateral portion of the, uh, posterior lateral portion, I should say, of the calcaneus where we heel strike along the lateral side of the foot and then transitioning across the metatarsal heads to the first metatarsal, right? And so the arch usually has a very different color to it, very different texture to it. The skin is much smoother. We tend to have much more calloused skin, much more um, kind of firm skin underneath these pressure points. And that's normal. That's what should be happening here because of the weight bearing um, that occurs in these particular areas. We shouldn't be bearing weight through the arch of the foot. The arch of the foot is going to be much more rigid when we go in toward push-off, um, and this creates a nice easy lever mechanism um, for the plantar fascia to produce the wind last mechanism um, and for the 
uh, Achilles to help to transmit this passive energy generation up the limb toward the, you know, what uh, Grakovetsky called the spinal engine toward the psoas major and help kind of spring that pelvis forward as we continue to produce this cyclic uh, ambulatory movement. Okay. So the sesamoids, they're really essential for this sort of thing because they're, they're kind of the, they're almost like the shield that we have to kind of think about for uh, the entire forefoot. The forefoot is very vulnerable to friction forces because of its function, right? Being able to go from a fully uh, dorsiflexed ankle in essentially our, our uh, terminal stance position right before we go into heel lift, um, moving toward that heel raise position and going toward push off. If there wasn't this sesamoid mechanism, we would have so much more friction lost as far as that energy expenditure. We talk about energy never really being able to be created or dispersed. It can only be transitioned from you know potential to kinetic or lost through friction and heat into the ground via the ground reaction forces. So if we don't have this ability to uh, limit and minimize the amount of friction that we lose into the ground, um, we're really burning up a lot of tissue there. And our feet just wouldn't be capable of tolerating that sort of force, you know, as a as an organism that has to be able to ambulate for survival, right? Because survival to um, our body, essentially, um, from an evolutionary perspective, is still we need to be able to find food, we need to be able to find water, we need to be able to find shelter, we need to be able to escape uh, potential predators. That's still the evolutionary mandate that our bodies have at this point. And if we were essentially forced to, um, you know, forage for food, uh, forage for uh, food, hunt for food, um, you know, run away from predators, things of that sort of nature, but we're just burning up um, the bottom of our feet and our forefoot, uh, we wouldn't be able to get very far. Um, and so that, that sort of thing is really, it's very important. However, with that said, there are, I, I would wager, there are literally a thousand or more mechanisms by which this this process can be interrupted. Um, and we talked briefly about them last session. If we have a plant early subluxed cuboid, that's going to affect peroneus longus recruitment, potentially the setting of the first of the first metatarsal head. Okay, so that's one potential issue. If we have a limitation of ankle dorsiflexion, that's going to force us to lift our heel early, probably forcing us to load the medial side of the foot, medial side of the forefoot early. Um, before everything is set, before the closed packing has occurred of the uh, cuboid, et cetera. Um, and it, it will it essentially produce premature setting of that first metatarsal head, which may happen before the sesamoids are in place. Um, similar sort of thing if we have an inversion subluxation of the subtalar joint, we're suddenly not able to evert the calcaneus. That's going to prevent closed packing of the cuboid. It's going to prevent adequate medial tilt of the talus to essentially fixate that ankle mortise and produce that superior uh, vector through the um, through the fibula that's going to affect cubo uh, that's going to affect peroneal recruitment again and very likely going to affect stride length right it'll limit our stride length limit the ability of us to kind of uh, flatten out and distort those uh, connective tissues throughout the foot forcing us to add more energy into the system. So again, another problem with those things. These are things that are local, right? Just a few of, again, dozens of, of issues that could potentially occur within the foot. Um, if we start thinking about something that's not um, a stiffness, that's not a limitation of movement, but something that's more of a um, instability, you know, say we have a plant uh, uh, spring ligament uh, insufficiency, that's gonna cause the medial foot to collapse Again, that's going to force us onto the first metatarsal head early, prevent adequate placement of the sesamoids. Then we have to start considering the possibility for either neurophysiological or neurological components that come into this. Neurological components like, say, an L5 uh, or an S1 radiculopathy would produce a fatigable weakness of the peroneals. Again, same sort of thing. That would affect setting of that set of the first metatarsal head and those sesamoid bones. If we had a facilitation, say of, uh, it could be basically anything in the lower extremity. So L4 would affect tone of the ankle dorsiflexors. It's going to affect um, potential 
uh, tone of the quadriceps, et cetera. So these things can affect how and where the placement of the knee is relative to the foot. Um, so kind of a balance point issue if we end up more medially kind of almost resting on the medial um, components of medial stability components of the knee, like the MCL, et cetera, the joint capsule. We're going to come over that medial side of the foot far too early, start to break down the medial foot components like the spring ligament, et cetera. Again, setting that sesamoid inappropriately or ill timing that setting. Um, and what ends up happening is we start seeing this uh, kind of very inevitable sequela of pain scenarios, right? And they're listed right here. At least a few of them are metatarsalgia. That's a common one that we see on prescriptions, things of that sort of nature. Morton's neuroma. These are those kind of uh, very, very stinging, very um, almost nervy type pains that we get either on the dorsal surface or the plantar surface of the foot as these uh, interdigital nerves run in between the metatarsals. And what'll happen is we'll get this kind of compression in between those um, as the foot kind of folds up. Stress fractures, um, these tend to get more common as you start looking at uh, endurance athletes, et cetera, but they can very easily have many of these problems. Um, and eventually some of these things can lead to something as serious as aseptic necrosis of the second toe. Um, we've seen uh, necrosis of the sesamoids themselves, things like hallux valgus, um, where instead of setting the sesamoids underneath the first metatarsal head, we start to essentially externally rotate the foot and roll over um, the medial side of that MTP joint. What this eventually will do to a patient is it will sublux, or I, I guess you can almost call it dislocate, the sesamoid bones. Um, it would actually be laterally, but more midline of the foot toward the second metatarsal. Um, and once that's happened, once that's occurred, those things have subluxed or dislocated, however you want to, however you want to view the problem, um, it, it, they can't, can't be reduced. Um, it can't happen conservatively. It's not something that we can do. Um, uh, but at that point we've lost that bridge, right? We've lost that shield for all that frictional forces, um, uh, that'll occur across that first metatarsal head now. Um, when this happens, it will start to essentially peel off the periosteum um, from the first metatarsal head, that medial portion of the first metatarsal head, just to, uh, just proximal to the uh, big toe, uh, to the hallux. And as that periosteum starts to peel away from the bone itself, what happens is we get what's called a hyperostosis. Um, and it just, it triggers the formation of new bony tissue. Um, and that fills in that gap in between the periosteum here and the actual bone here. So this space in between becomes filled in with bone. And that's where we start to develop these bunion type things um, that we'll see very consistently in some patients that come in with these types of foot pain. Um, I will almost always, when I'm in clinic looking at these sort of things, I'll always ask if the patients had these things their entire life, right? Because you can't have congenital bunions in these sort of areas. It's the acquired ones, the ones where they're like, no, you know, that that started occurring over the course of the last, you know, 10, 15, 20 years um, as this pain was developing. Well, to me, that's an instantaneous thought that this sort of process is occurring, that we've that we've lost the ability to set these sesamoids properly. Um, to affect load transfer, okay? And those are things that we can still work with, even though very likely if we have a very significant hallux valgus, we're unlikely to be able to get uh, any type of reduction of where the sesamoids sit, that, you know, that these patients sometimes have had surgeries to correct these things. Um, the worst ones that I see essentially are the ones that have come in with the fused first MTP, because um, essentially you need an you need adequate uh, hallux extension in order for your gait cycle to be efficient. Um, minimum, bare minimum that you have to be able to get for extension at the first MTP joint is 60 degrees to have an adequate uh, normal stride. Um, so as you start losing that sort of thing, and again, you will lose that sort of thing with this sort of uh, hallux valgus load, right? Because the inflammation that occurs, that periostitis and that hyperostosis of the bone, it will affect the joint, the articular structure of that first MTP. 
and the capsular pattern of the first MTP is the loss of extension, right? So it's almost a self-perpetuating problem at that point, because now if you can't get adequate toe extension, you have no, no choice but to externally rotate the foot and roll over the medial side of the first metatarsal head. So again, kind of that snowball effect. We see this, um, what's the other one that I think of when we see this? It's, it's that sort of like the feedback loop for some of the um, trigeminal issues that we can get via the way that it affects um, blood chemistry and the blowing off of CO2, because that's going to essentially facilitate some of the upper trap, the SCM, and that's going to put us into a forward head position. It's going to force us to blow off more CO2. And that's just going to continue to perpetuate these um, abnormal blood uh, blood dynamics. So similar sort of thing is that once it starts, once this process starts, it, it kind of just starts rolling down the hill. And unless there is some intervention done, it's just going to continue to progress um, and progress, meaning get worse. So um, any questions about that stuff as far as these sort of things? these types of um, diagnoses. Nothing yet? Okay. So, uh, Eric, just in, in the Bunyans in general, as far as uh, I know that I can just speak for my wife and, and her whole family has them, you know, to go through times as far as painful, not painful. Um, and using my wife, for example, I mean, super hypermobile uh, as far as foot. Uh, I mean, the times that we just have, she's had pain. I've just almost done just some traction stuff with her and gotten some relief, but it's still a, a hypermobile joint and her entire foot. Is there anything else that you would typically do? Well, so the question becomes, is the other foot hypermobile? Yes, right? both of them are. Both of them are. So yeah. this is this is something that we'll talk about here in a couple of slides is where it comes uh, back to body type. So if she just happens to have a very hypermobile um, dynamic within her, within her skeletal system, uh, musculoskeletal system. That's just the way she is. So that's not pathological in and of itself, but it probably means that she has to have adequate motor recruitment, um, going through these sort of areas. So if we start looking at any of the inhibitory processes that could occur, um, either within the foot or coming from above, descending from above, we, we would have to look at neurological, uh, components, you, you would probably be able to know at this point if something like that was going on, um, whether that's a true radiculopathy or a peripheral neuropathy or some sort of AXT issue that can affect overall motor recruitment. And for somebody that has a very mobile foot, uh, those motor dynamics are really important to help maintain stability. The other thing coming from above would be facilitatory influences where we have, um, changes in length tension relationships between certain portions of the foot or the ankle for that matter. So if we have, you know, say an L5 facilitation, that could lead to what we consider to be um, a uh, reciprocal inhibition of an antagonistic muscle, right? So increased tone of say L5 musculature, if we have say S1 musculature, that's, an, that's an, a functional antagonist to that it will have uh, some of that reciprocal inhibition because of that tone uh, imbalance, right? Those things should even, e even each other out. Um, so that's definitely something that could come into play. And then from the obvious perspective, we could have uh, reflex in reflexive inhibition problems in and around the foot due to instability. Now, if, it, if we're transitioning from a position where these things are hypermobile to now these things are unstable, um, that's a situation where you would need to look into um, some sort of external support, some sort of, um, I, I'm usually of the opinion that we want to try and get the foot functioning as well as it can on its own and not need any external um, things like, like inserts, et cetera, taping, blah, 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 all these different things that we use that the profession tends to use in order to help with those things. But if we start to develop an instability where there's just, you know, say the spring ligament is insufficient, there's no compensating for that within the foot itself. We have to do something externally to compensate for that. Um, as far as the sesamoids go, so if they if she has a significant 
uh, Hallux valgus and significant bunions here, then odds are those sesamoids are no longer doing what they're supposed to do. Um, the best, best thing that I've found for that sort of issue is actually to take a, a, a small, um, like a quarter inch felt pad um, and put it on the, sh and put it on the insert in the, in the shoe, within the shoe. So basically you take the insert out of the shoe, whatever the insert is, whether it's just the thing that came with the shoe, or if it's something specific that's been made um, by an orthopedic doc, by a podiatrist, by et cetera, um, by an orthotist. You, you take those things out and you cut out a small piece of felt pad and then you glue it to the underneath where the big, uh, the uh, first MTP joint would be. And what that does is now it's taking, instead of having to bring the foot to the floor um, where the sesamoids would be, because essentially we have, if this is the floor and this is the first metatarsal head, the sesamoids should be taking up that space in between. Um, we would otherwise have to bring the toe, the foot to the floor, which is difficult to do when we have all these sort of potential um, pathophysiological problems, whether, like we said, it's uh, neurophysiological, neurological, mechanical, et cetera. Um, any of these things can affect that. So what we're doing instead is we're essentially bringing the, the floor up to the foot by putting this little uh, quarter inch spacer in there. Um, it's not going to completely unload the friction that occurs there but it's gonna do a better job of setting that first metatarsal head for them on something and helping them to create a rigid uh, medial uh, medial foot. And essentially that sounds like what's what you think is part of the equation here is the foot's just very mobile. Um, and so being able to create that rigid arch through the medial foot would be, would be one of the first priorities that I would kind of look at um, in that sort of scenario. But you could go through and you could do force output testing throughout the lower quadrant to see if you can determine you know, is there some sort of fatigable weakness, which would kind of encompass our neurological problems, plus AXT issues, um, velocity dependent weakness, which would essentially look for facilitation, and or, you know, this breaking weakness that would occur kind of on our first repetition, that might suggest some sort of local um, articular pathology. Dave, you have anything you want to add with any of that? Are you still there? You're I mean, it's such a wide topic. And so, so I'm going to kind of continue on your thread versus taking it sideways, because there's so many different directions to go with once you can't load the first metatarsal head. So me coming in from a different angle. Yeah. Again, no, it's 100%. Everything you're describing is kind of in line with how I think. But it's yeah. best to kind of continue to train the thought, and then we'll talk about just cases or kind of what we see when we commonly see this. Yeah, it'd be, it'd be actually interesting, Chan, if you wanted to. We you. Once we get through all of this stuff at some point, if you wanted to take that kind of in-depth dive and look at your wife's foot and see, you know, I, the first thing I would do is I'd do the force output testing because that would give us a pretty good idea of, well, number one, there's local pathology that needs to be addressed. Number two, if it's neurological. And then finally, number three, if there's some sort of neurophysiological facilitatory influences that come into contact with it. And if you had good results as far as, you know, being confident in what you're finding, and we could kind of talk through how that might affect something like this um, in more of a, you know, particular case type of scenario. Uh, but we should really get through all of this stuff before we get too specific about a particular <laughs> complication. Because like we were saying, like I was saying, there's dozens, if not maybe more than a thousand types of issues that could cause these sort of problems. Um, the fact that it's, you know, I well, we'll talk more about it as we go, but um, yeah, so you're looking talking all the way from genetic predisposition and foot design to anything biomechanical that creates a twist or you know turning things on and off. There's there's a ton of things that go on, and even once you get initial, it's fine. Even if you get to stage one hallux valgus, it basically the inhibition of the foot intrinsics is almost immediate. So you only need a mild change in that angle, and then all of a sudden the foot intrinsics aren't firing properly, and now all of a sudden the system starts to collapse on itself. Yeah, it, it becomes a tough thing, but there's there's options here. Do you have something else, Jen? Were you going to say something? No, I was just saying thanks. Yeah. All right. So anyway, I want you guys to be pretty co comfortable with the ideas here. Um, and it we, When we talk about it, we make it seem like it's a, a very intimidating type of um, scenario to encounter, right? So... 
you get somebody that comes in and they have metatarsalgia, you ask them where it hurts and they point right under that second or third toe, um, second or third metatarsal head. And you're saying, okay, well, odds are the reason this is occurring is because I'm not setting those sesamoids properly. The first thing I'm going to do in most cases, I'm just going to examine the foot. I'm going to look at the ankle first, subtalar joint next, and I'm just going to work down the medial side of the foot. I'm going to check out all the, all those sort of things. And a lot of times you'll find something in there, even if it's not the primary problem, but it doesn't matter because you have to fix, <laughs> you have to fix the dynamics, the motor, dy uh, the um, articular dynamics of the foot. Otherwise, if you find something, you know, that's de a descending influence, like a facilitation, for instance, not going to matter because the foot's not going to move well enough. It's not going to close pack well enough. Um, it's not going to produce this passive energy generation well enough for any of these descending elements to make a difference, right? A facilitation at L5 could very easily have a, a causative factor for why somebody develops a metatarsalgia. But if they also happen to have a sublux subtalar joint, you got to fix the subtalar joint in order to even remotely try and fix whatever's going on at L5. So those sort of things are are pretty essential. You almost have to look, you have to, I, I won't say almost, you do have to look at the foot first because those local pathologies, they'll just get in the way. You got to get rid of them. And those are the easier things to correct anyway, right? The biome biomechanical faults, these stiff joints, those sort of things. We like that, right? Ugh, there we go. We're manual therapists. We want to make things move. Um, so those are those are the things that we like seeing when we're examining patients for this sort of thing. Because it's like, okay, good. Maybe this is just a, a stiff subtalar joint, sublux subtalar joint that I can fix that. And then I can help re-educate their, their movement patterns, gait patterns, et cetera, um, to get them back to normal. Maybe that's all it is. That'd be sweet. Um, is it the most common profile? Eh, I wouldn't say it's the most common um, because essentially a lot of these patients, especially if they've already developed some hallux valgus, um, uh, deviations there in the foot, it's been there for a little while, right? This, this sort of thing has already been kind of lurking around. It started to make some structural changes to the bone, to the joint, to the alignment and position of the different uh, structures in the foot. The odds are those things are kind of been lurking around there for a little while. So that, that could mean that there's other problems coming in, but um, it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be a, a totally, um, intimidating thought process when these sort of things come in there. Cause you guys have all the tools you need, all the, all the necessary tools, as far as being able to do the examination, being able to get from A to B, uh, to figure out where these etiologies are coming from. Right. So don't, don't get too intimidated, go through the processes here, figure out where things need, things are potentially coming from. And then just continue to work off of that. If you treat that sublux subtalar joint on the first session, they come in and they're like, man, I'm, I'm 80% better just after that. You're thinking, sweet, that's good. This could be just a rehab issue, but now it gives you the opportunity to better address or better diagnose any potential uh, descending etiologies, facilitations, neurological impairments, things of that sort of nature. Um, and that's that's a good thing. That puts us in a much better spot to get this get this person not just well I'm feeling better and I'm able to get back to activity, but get them hopefully to a point where a lot of these things aren't going to happen to them again. Because um, that's the that's the big thing. If we miss something, if we miss some contributing etiology, doesn't matter how good we are with our hands, these things will continue to come back. All right, what do we got next? You lift. So this is basically where we left off. I think. Um, as we were talking about this last time, but essentially once we've closed packed the ankle joint and the gastroc tension has become sufficient, the heel is going to start to lift, right? And the calcaneus is going to swing back into eversion, uh, excuse me, inversion, the lateral foot, all that closed packing is going to release. Um, all that energy is transferred up the leg through the Achilles, through the hamstrings, through the peroneals, all these different tissues, um, and then into the pelvis via things like the sacrotuberous ligament and the thoracolumbar fascia, okay? These things help us to produce that spinal engine motor um, that we really wanna have because we wanna be able to produce efficient, um, minimal energy loss gait, right? That's the, that's the reason that we are the most efficient ambulatory animals on the planet. 
Um, and if we're able to do that, if we're able to transition these things, then we're going to be in good shape. Problems with this come into come into effect when we are suddenly unable to transition that energy, right? So we talked about potentially having to add energy back into the system. Um, you know, say we have a stiff hip and we can't get into good hip extension. So now we have to kind of pull the leg forward um, using that hip flexor that can give us these hip flexor tendinopathies. It can give us these anterior subluxations like the euphor lesions, et cetera. Um, that's us forcing more energy into the system using muscle activation, using muscle contraction. The other possibility is, is that suddenly this energy is no longer able to escape these tissues, right? So say everything's functioning well down the leg, but I have that stiff hip or I have a um, SI joint pelvis dysfunction. And all of a sudden this um, energy is dissipating within the sacrotuberous ligament. Well, that could very easily start to break down that sacrotuberous ligament or the thoracolumbar fascia or the hamstring insertion, uh, the hamstring origin point on the ischial tuberosity. All of these sort of things we have to kind of take into consideration, right? Um, basically, if we're looking at it, if you guys see the note that we have down here, a stiff hip will actually alleviate the stress on the lower quadrant, on the leg, okay, from a torsional standpoint. Meaning if we don't have adequate hip extension, we're actually going to lose hip internal rotation as well. That's going to alleviate the amount of external rotation we need to decompensate with at both the knee, at the ankle, and then with these abduction moments or uh, rotational moments within the foot itself. We don't have to do as much of it because the hip is not producing the internal rotation above it, but it does demand more energy production. Okay, so that's the same thing we were just talking about. We have to work harder in order to add that energy back into the system and keep propelling us forward, right? And the body will do that automatically, but it can lead to the breakdown of some of the structures that have to produce that energy at that point. Okay, and usually that's going to be some sort of overuse or what we call forced overuse, tendinopathy, uh, tenomuscular junction issues, things of that sort of nature, trigger points, et cetera, right? So that's sometimes where we will see that stuff. All right. So um, we did talk about this during one of the classes that I was there um, doing, um, but the idea of body type versus environment. So we were, I was kind of chatting with Chan about this um, just now, um, you know, asking, are both of his wife's feet really mobile? Is that kind of the way they've always been? Yes, that is. Well, that's her body type. She has a mobile body type. And we have to look at body type as a spectrum, right? So we have somebody that's really stiff, almost ankylosed on one side. And we have somebody that's super floppy and probably unstable in a lot of areas that has maybe a hypermobility syndrome on the other, on the other span. And most of us fit somewhere within that spectrum usually somewhere right here toward the middle, right? In this in this kind of uh, median type of range within that spectrum. Um, but people can fall anywhere along that, right? And so we have to take that into consideration when we're thinking about how we need to approach evaluating this person, right? And determining what's best as far as treatment. So the one that I always use, uh, the example that I always use is a cashier. Uh, at a supermarket, right? As much as they that job seems like it might be going away at this point, because every every place now has self checkout and you know check out on your phone and just walk out the door and whatnot. Um, if you have somebody that is a very stiff body type, that is standing on a hard concrete surface, which is what most stores have, right? And what they're doing is they're taking something from the conveyor belt and they're twisting over those feet, scanning it, and then putting it down another conveyor belt for somebody to bag up on the far side, we have this kind of constant rotational twisting movement that occurs with this person thousands of times a day, right? Somebody that has a very rigid body type is not going to tolerate that stress very well because the feet, you think about it, should be flattening and folding and flattening and folding the thorax should be twisting and twisting the pelvis should be rotating and rotating all these sort of things should be occurring very smoothly but if you just have a very stiff body 
that doesn't have a lot of this range, a lot of this pliability within the structure of your body, how it's put together, you're not going to do real well in that sort of job. You know, same thing with like a factory worker that's doing a very similar sort of thing. Um, that's just not something that's go their body's not going to adapt very well to that sort of task. Right. But we had to figure those things out. Number one, what's the task? Well, my body is broken down. I hurt like crazy by the time I'm done with my work week. So I work Monday through Friday as a cashier. I'm there eight hours a day. And by the time my Friday rolls around, Friday evening rolls around, I can barely walk over the weekend. I start to feel better by the time Sunday evening rolls around. And then I go right back to work on Monday and the cycle starts all over again. Right. So the task then work. You work as a cashier. Okay. What, what does that entail? How can we figure out what that entails? Right. Um, then we need to kind of think about, all right, this is what they're going to be doing at this particular profession at, with this particular activity. Where are these things likely breaking down? Well, you know, obviously number one, we need to figure out where the pain response is coming in. You know, is this pain within the foot? Is it lower back pelvis SI joint pain? Um, is it hip pain, knee pain? We, you know, we have to figure those things out. And then we're, we're into looking for our diagnosis. Okay. If it's say it's pain in the knee, right. Say it's lateral joint line pain within the knee. My experience, the most common issue with that is, is lateral coronary ligament issues, right? Okay, great. We test that out. Best thing for that is actual palpation, right? Digital palpation. And then what we'll do is we say, okay, that's positive. That reproduces their exact pain. We know it's lateral coronary ligament irritation. Where does that usually come from? Well, for me, I think I, I think I've made this statement and I'll I'll stand by it based off of my own clinical experience. 100 percent of the time that comes from a subtalar joint restriction. Um, it may not be the case. It may be more like 95 percent of the time. But in my clinical experience, it's been 100 um, percent, which is good. We like those percentages, high percentages, things like that. That gives us a direct place to go look for our etiology right? Straight down to that subtalar joint. Boom. There it is. We find it. Cool. We can look at this. We can figure out ways to fix this sort of thing. Um, and then figure out ways to help this person adapt to this environment. Could be something as simple as they have to bring in a pad, some sort of pad to stand on just to cushion their, that, uh, ground reaction force, that constant rotary ground reaction force. Um, that might be all it takes. Maybe softer footwear, maybe, you know, some sort of different footwear. Um, there's lots of different things we can do with that sort of stuff in order to help this person, but it's the environment that's part of the problem, right? Environment includes number one, the physical makeup of what they're standing on, what they're, and then also what they're doing within that environment. So our cashier is standing on a hard surface with, with a rotational movement. If it was something like a golfer, for instance, they're probably not standing on a hard surface. They're standing on grass, right? But they're doing their rotations at a much higher speed, right? It's a different, and they're doing it in both directions, right? So we have our backswing here, and then we have our actual swing through in the other direction. Again, things that we have to take into consideration, all kinds of different possibilities here. Um, one thing I do want to mention, this is why I put it down here in this note, which type does better with sitting at a desk all day? Stiff body type or rigid body or uh, mobile body type? Well, neither of them. None of, none of them do that well. That's not something that we're designed to do, right? If you think about um, in my, so in my uh, clientele that I have, I see a lot of, you know, relatively young, young to middle-aged professionals, right? So they have office jobs they you know come into the office during they come into my office during the day they sit they work at a computer they sit in meetings they sit in the car they sit on the train whatever it is they're sitting all day but they're active people uh, most people here in Colorado are pretty active um they're done with they get done with work what's the first thing they want to do well i'm going to go for a run oh i'm going to go to the gym oh i got a softball game oh i'm going to go play nine holes of golf with a buddy like okay the, these are these are significant <laughs> dueling dynamics. The idea of sitting in an anterior dominant position, meaning everything is kind of rolled forward, hips flexed, shoulders protracted, all that, you know, head forward, sitting in that sort of position for eight to 10 hours a day. And then the dichotomy of then saying, well, I'm going to do this very dynamic 
upright activity like going for a three mile run even in your even in your mid 20s late 20s early 30s where your body should be still relatively capable um, from a physical perspective you're demanding a lot for the body to be able to go from one extreme to the other um, and I think a lot of times that's part of where some of these things come on as far as overuse injuries is we're 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 putting our bodies in this situation where we have to tolerate a certain stress, which is this sitting. And then we're, we're asking it to immediately go from that, that sort of situation, that sort of sustained position posture to this more dynamic, uh, more extension based um, act to upright activity. And I, I think that's very difficult for the body to handle. Um, Cause again, if you think about evolutionarily, our bodies are typically going to be up and moving around all day, right? foraging for food, hunting for food, looking for water, um, you know, avoiding predators, et cetera. So all these sort of things are stuff that we're supposed, you know, climbing, uh, jumping, et cetera. All these things are things that we're supposed to be doing on a regular basis um, during our day and not just after our work day. But we've, we've kind of transitioned into this much more sedentary lifestyle for most people. So again, the duality, I think, is that is a lot to ask for a lot of people. All right. Any questions about body type versus environment? Nope. Oh, okay. Getting close here. Yeah. All right. So the lumbopelvic mechanism, how is it involved? Um, I always want to look at the TL junction when this sort of issues come up, right? It's one of the most mobile regions of the body. Very good at absorbing torsional forces. It's supposed to be, right? Outside of the AA joint, the T11, T12 segment in the TL junction is the second most mobile spinal segment. At least it should be. Um, so that is definitely something that you're going to want to look at. If you lose motion there, you have to absorb those torsional forces somewhere else. Um, whether that's going to be above or below, it depends on the task. If it's something like running, it's usually going to be below. It's usually going to, usually going to be in the lumbosacral junction. Um, if it's something that involves like an overhead motion, like throwing, for instance, or swinging a golf club or swinging a bat, you may get, um, those forces absorbed above kind of that mid thoracic area. Um, but it, it, it may also play into the idea that, well, if you also have issues above that, say in the CT junction, uh, which is very common, I used to, at one point, whenever I had issues in the TL junction, I automatically looked at the CT junction as well every single time. And I, I realized that I didn't have to do that every single time, but I still do it quite a bit. Um, because I do think, I do think you're more prone to have CT junction issues if you have a TL junction issue and vice versa. I do think that's definitely possible. And I've definitely had patients where I've been trying to get a TL junction problem to, um, carry over to maintain the corrections that I've done with it. And it refuses to carry over until I go up and I discover that there's a, a concurrent CT junction problem. Um, and once I correct that, then it starts to carry over much better. So I've seen that quite a bit. Um, I'm sure Dave has seen that quite a bit as well. It's like a rotational trigger. Once I see that trigger for rotation, it's like, okay, I have to work through all the rotational joints. I did that a great case of it just this morning where it's like, okay, there's the trigger. You know, it was a hip pain. But then it's like, once I saw one thing, it's like, oh, it doesn't walk with an arm swing. It's like, okay, now I got to look at all his rotary joints, you know, because he doesn't have reciprocal arm swing, but his back's not kyphotic. Yep. So, you know, from there, TL junction, CT junction, foot, you know, already looked at the hip, you know, pel dynamic pelvic motion. So it's just like, I just look at it as a button. It's like, yeah, okay, got to look at all the rotary joints and I'll start, you know, proximal and work out just like you described. Yep. And, I, and again, Jim kind of has this thought process and I agree with it um, for the most part that you, you don't want to start you don't want somebody to come in with foot pain and immediately go to the CT junction as the problem area, right? You want to, you want to be able to look at it and say, well, is there something local here that I can look at? Cause it's, if you find a sublux talus, that's more likely to be the cause of the foot pain than something in the CT junction. Now, as you progress through working on this patient, you may get to the situation where you're like, Oh, I'm 80% better. I, you know, you do the ankle, I'm 80% better. All right. Well, let's see what else could be going on. Well, you find a hip issue, you know, maybe a for lesion on the same side. You fix that sort of thing. All right, cool. I'm up to 90% better. I'm really doing pretty well. Okay, what else? Okay, and then you're looking at TL junction. You're kind of following things based off of how they progress. 
definitely a possibility. Um, all right, so if we're looking at lumbopelvic and hip musculature, we talked a bit about this on the first day that we started going through this these slides. The psoas major will create lumbar extension, ipsilateral side bending, meaning side bending to the same side as the psoas, that, that individual psoas, and then contralateral rotation, right? So my right psoas major will create lumbar extension, right side bending, and left rotation. Okay, that's our latexion moment um, that we do consider to be a more functional movement for both the lumbar spine and the TL junction. Okay. The multifidi, because of their attachment points, will produce the exact same uh, latexion moment. Okay. Glute max uh, will definitely drive motion because it is, a hip it is a hip extensor, so it will help to propel us forward, but it also is very important for stability along with uh, the latissimus dorsi because of their interconnection with the TL uh, thoracolumbar fascia. And the orientation of those as they create this kind of X shape going across the lumbopelvic mechanism, they're very ideally positioned to create a compressive force of both sacroiliac joints. Um, so those are very important. And if we have inhibition of either the glute max because of hip issues or because of lumbopelvic issues um, or of the lats because of potentially uh, TL junction issues where it attaches through there, or maybe even shoulder issues as it goes all the way up and attaches to the um, medial edge of the bicipital groove, uh, any of those things can affect stability through the SI joint. Okay, So something else that we need to consider. Uh, biceps femoris, sacrotuberous ligament, and the erector spinae, the, this is what we call the uh, deep longitudinal sling. Um, basically, the biceps femoris comes up the leg, it attaches to this uh, ischial tuberosity, there's actually a continuation of those same fibers from the tendon as the sacrotuberous ligament to the inferior lateral angle of the, of the sacrum. Those have interconnections with all the erector spine, the deep erector spinae muscle groups that are able to help for help transfer uh, energy all the way from the fibular head, um, meaning all the way down from the attachment of the, of the peroneals in the foot up to the fibular head connecting to the biceps femoris and then transitioning all the way up through the trunk. So a lot of stability, a lot of easy ways for muscle uh, and this kinetic, this passive kinetic energy to transition through the limb and into the trunk. All right. And we've been kind of talking about this the whole time we've been going through these slides. We have all kinds of potential causes for breakdown here. Uh, hypomobility, these are the easy ones. These are the ones that we like to find. Sublux talus, dropped cuboids, subtalar joint issues, a euphor, arthritic hip, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, on and on and on. Instability becomes a little more difficult. In fact, I would say it becomes substantially more difficult because we have to look at how do we deal with this instability. Something like a mortise instability, well, that I can deal with because being able to do our uh, mortise taping we have a real easy job of helping to restabilize that by primary intention, meaning we can actually fix that instability with that compression. Things like hyperextension of the knee or, you know, a, a, a linear instabilities of the knee like uh, ACL lesions and whatnot, SI joint instability, things like this become much more difficult for us to handle because in most cases they're going to require some sort of external bracing, um, et cetera, et cetera, right? Neuromuscular deficit, again, more difficult to deal with because number one, we have to find it, right? Whether it's a facilitation, a radiculopathy, what's it coming from? Is it peripheral nerve? Is it AXT? Is it a nerve root? Uh, is it a, you know, are we dealing with a facilitation? Is it a totally different animal that, that affects reflex mechanisms down into the leg because of the way that it'll affect length tension relationships, pain and reflex inhibition, all these things can play a very substantial role in how the breakdown of some of these lower extremity and uh, trunk structures will occur. Okay. Uh, what do we got? Last one here. Okay. So this is kind of the soapbox moment here. Um, we can't just look at one particular body region, right? We have to be able to take into consideration how all of these body regions interact during the patient's meaningful task. Okay. This is another Diane Lee terminology meaningful task is this is what they want to do that they're 
incapable of doing right now because of this sort of pain, right? So we want to be able to look at all these different things, figure out where these problems are coming from, and then do what we can to correct them. That might mean manipulating a sublux joint. It might mean trying to stabilize a hypermobility. It might mean re-educating a neuromuscular in inhibitory process or reflex inhibition or something of that nature. The point is, plain and simple, is we want you guys to be good at clinical judgment, good at clinical reasoning, and not just a technician. Okay. Technicians can come into our classes and learn how to do these techniques. No problem, right? We can bring in people with good, you know, dexterous hands and they can learn how to do the exam. Uh, they can learn how to do a manipulation pretty quickly, right? We could spend a day with somebody and they know how to do what they're supposed to do pretty fast. That's not what this job is about. This job is about being a clinically reasoned practitioner so that we can get to the point where you can look at these things, figure out where they're coming from, from an efficient standpoint, um, and get these people back to where they're able to function more naturally. But hopefully it's a situation where they're able to manage these things on their own. Now, if they need tune-ups from time to time, that happens a lot. Um, but the process, these thought processes that we've been going through about the potential for all these influences, that's what we want you guys to be able to be good at by the time you're done with this thing. All right. That is all I got, Dave. You got anything else you want to add? You're muted. Sorry. No, it's good to kind of stick with kind of where you were the slides. It's a good thing to review. Again, I'm going to cut this up, put it together. And the idea on this is to kind of take it then more clinically. Everything we talked, everything Eric has talked about in these slides, when we get to the lab course. And we're going to do that with cases and examples, and we'll kind of work through the process. But it's kind of nice to have the foundation now, so your mind just starts starts percolating in your mind a bit. And I could try and get the video to you this weekend to see if you can start going through it a little bit for those of you who want to kind of go through this a little further before we get into the weekend. Sounds good. Good. All right, guys, be good. Yep. Catch you all next Enjoy. time.